sa kasalukuyan, malaki ang tulong ng teknolohiya sa pagpapaunlad ng sarili. Nang ibang iba ang kakayahan at pagbabahagi ng mahalagang impormasyon. Upang maging mas maalam tungkol sa iba't ibang isyong kinakaharap ng lipunan. Ngunit sa kabila nito, ang teknolohiya ay mayroon ding bitbit na banta sa ating privacy online. May mga pagkakataon na hindi natin nalalaman na ang bawat pagpindot at pag-access natin sa iba't ibang sites. Maaari pinoproseso na ng malalaking korporasyon ng ating mga data para sa kanilang ganansya. Mayroon din namang mga tao na sadyang mapagsamantala lamang sa pagkuha ng ating mga data para magamit laban sa atin. Kaya ating patuloy na ipinapanawagan na tutulan ang mga walang pahintulon na pagpuposeso sa ating data. Lalo na sa mismong mga plataforma na ating pinagbibilangan gaya ng iba't ibang social networking sites. Kasama rin sa ating kampanya ang wakasan ang lahat ng forma ng pangaabuso online. Halos hindi na natin may pagkaiba ang digital sa non-digital rights. Dahil kalakit na ito ng ating mga pang-araw-araw na gawain. Mula sa pag-aaral, trabaho at libangan ang pagiging online. Mas mabuti na ang maging maalam. Kung hindi ngayon, kailan? Kung hindi tayo, sino? Tara na! Tara na! Tara na! At samahan kaming isulok ang digital right ng bawat Pilipino. Alright, magandang magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Kamusta po tayong lahat na nandito live via Zoom? Magandang magandang hapon po. At pati na rin po sa lahat ng makasamahan natin sa Facebook Live. Sana po ay okay tayong lahat at handa na para sa ilang oras ng tiyak na magiging mainit na usapan. Apat na po siyam na taon na nang nakalipas mula nang ideklara ang batas militar o ang martial law sa ating bansa ni dating Pangulong Ferdinand Edralin Marcos. Tatlumput limang taon na rin mula nang nag-aklas ang taong bayan at napaalis ang sinasabing authoritarian sa Malacanang. Ngunit hanggang ngayon ay patuloy na kontrobersyal pa rin ang usapin ang mga pangyayari noong panahon ng martial law. Maraming iba't ibang kwento tungkol sa martial law at sa rehimen ni Pangulong Marcos. Ngunit ano nga ba ang kwento ng taong bayan patungkol dito? Sama-sama natin pag-uusapan kung ano nga ba ang nangyari noong panahon ng martial law at ano nga ba ang epekto ng ating kasaysayan sa ating kasalukuyan at pati na rin sa ating hinaharap. Magandang hapon po muli. Ako po si Jules Giang mula sa Rappler para sa kwento natin to, Reclaiming the Stories of Our Nation. Ito ang martial law, Never Forget, Never Again. The martial law, Never Forget, Never Again Forum is co-presented by Dakila. Philippine Collective for Modern Heroism, Task Force Detainees of the Philippines, Justice, Peace, and Integrity of Creations, Commission of the Association of Major Religious Superiors in the Philippines, and Philippine Alliance of Human Rights Advocates. This forum is in partnership with 
in Defense of Human Rights and Dignity Coalition or IDEFEND We the Future PH alternatibong katipunan ng mga mag-aaral sa UP o ACMA UP, PUP Bukluran ng Psikolohiyang Pilipino, North Luzon Cinema Guild, Union of Progressive Students, UP Cebu, Green FM of DLSU Dasmarinas. Maraming salamat din po sa lahat ng ating media partners. Ang Rappler ay kasama rin sa mga media partners ng festival kasama ang Courage On Coalition na sumusuporta sa ating event. This forum is our first forum event for the Active Vista International Human Rights Festival 2021 with the theme, Kwento Natin To, Reclaiming Our Stories as a Nation. Ang AV International Human Rights Festival, ito po ay magsisimula ngayong araw, September 21 hanggang October 10, 2021. Marami po kaming hinanda para sa inyong lahat. And if you want to know more, Information about the film offerings and the activities for this festival, you can visit us at www.activevista.ph or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash activevista. Ngayong hapong ito, sama-sama natin pag-uusapan ang kwento ng ating nakaraan na hanggang ngayon ay patuloy na nagiging kontrobersal dahil sa patuloy na pagbalak na baguhin ang istorya ng ating pagpupunyagi laban sa diktadurya. Kasama po natin ngayong hapon na ito ay iba't ibang mga eksperto upang tayo ay mabigyang linaw sa kwento ng ating bayan tungkol sa martial law. Sa mga kasama po natin dito sa Zoom, tayo po ay naka-Zoom meeting format. Maaari nyo pong itype ang inyong mga tanong or kung meron po kayong mga comments o insights sa ating chat box, maaari nyo pong gawin yan. Ang ating pong chat box ay malayang espasyo para po sa ating lahat. We respect and value your thoughts and ideas at kung gusto nyo rin pong malaman ang saloobin ng isa't isa tungkol sa ating talakayan. Reminder lang po na lagi tayong maging mindful sa ating mga sasabihin. Kindly refrain using offensive or violent language including hate speech towards other sectors or groups of people. No hateful or discriminatory comments towards race gender, sexual orientation, or political beliefs. Please, no to bullying. Ganon din po sa ating mga viewers sa ating Facebook page. Maaari rin nyo rin pong isulat ang inyong mga katanungan o mga insights sa ating mga pinag-uusapan gamit ang ating comment section. Susubukan po natin matugunan ang ilan sa inyong mga katanungan sa ating mga panauhin. We also prepared an open Jamboard na naka-flash ngayon po. If a flash po yan sa inyong mga screen, ang link and QR code. Sige po, puntahan nyo na po yung link na yan at pwede nyo rin pong iscan yan. Marin nyo pong ilagay dito ang inyong mga insights. So please feel free to post in our Jamboard. Alright, kung mayroon din po kayong mga uh, ikinababahala or kung ano pa man, marin nyo pong i-message ang ating organizing team na may AV team na sa kanilang pangalan dito po sa Zoom. So, pwede nyo po silang i-direct message. You can also share the knowledge and information you have gained from this forum, but please respect the privacy of our other attendees sa kanilang mga tanong o comments sa ating chat box or sa ating Jamboard. We also need to inform you that the entire session is being shown live on our Facebook page and is being recorded to be used later on as public material of the organizing team. If you wish not to be included in any public post, please feel free to inform us and turn off your cameras. You can also directly message anyone from our organizing team. So also, please put our microphones din po on mute para din po tayo, hindi tayo makadistract sa ating mga speakers. Panatiliin po natin maging safe space sa ating lahat ang forum na ito. Ngayon naman po, meron po tayong mechanics para po sa free tickets. Opo, may free tickets po tayo for frontline uh, film screenings of the festival. Para sa mas maging masigla ang ating diskusyon, mamimigay tayo ng 100 po na complimentary tickets randomly sa so, makasama natin ngayon sa Zoom. If you got randomly chosen, we will be sending you the complimentary tickets through the email you registered dito po sa ating forum. So maraming salamat po sa TFDP at sa PARA na sponsors ng ating tickets at makakanood tayo ng mga makabuluhang pelikula na tumatalakay sa martial law at sa maimportanteng issue ng ating panahon. For those who are lucky to get these tickets, you will have free access to any of the festival frontline films like ML, Respeto, Pisay, The Kingmaker, 
aswang, and tao po. At doon naman po sa mga kasama natin sa FB, maaari din po uh, and maaari din po from our attendees sa Zoom kung tayo po ay magsishare ng inyong mga insights at inyong mga photos with the hashtag never again message using hashtags hashtag never again and hashtag kwento natin po. Kayo rin po ay may chance na maaari kayo makakuha ring ticket. So hanggang 8pm po ang cut off natin sa at ating mga submission. And if you want to check out other film screening in the festival, please visit our link activevista.ph slash screenings. Alright, kaya naman simula na po natin ang ating pagkikwento. Our first topic for the day is truth-telling and the pains of our nation's past. And our first esteemed speaker is a known public historian, a television personality and academic best known for scholarly works on Philippine history and his numerous appearances as a commentator on historical topics on Philippine television. And he is currently a professor at De La Salle University. Friends, let's welcome Professor Xiao Chua. Professor Xiao, good afternoon sa'yo. Maraming salamat sa introduction at sa lahat ng ating mga kasama. Uh, naway maging makabuluhan ang inyong uh, pagbunita ng uh, ikaapat na putsyam na anibersaryo ng bisperas, ha? bisperas ng martial law, proclamation of martial law. No? Ang proclamation of martial law po ay talagang pinirmahan ni Pangulong Marcos at ipinahayag sa Sambayanan September 23, no? uh, to, uh, 1972. Subalit, kumbaga, naghinuli niya muna yung mga nais niyang hulihin bago, of course, niya ito ay sinapubliko. No? At uh, yun po yung nakakalungkot dyan na kaya ho yan September 21 ay sapagkat uh, uh, gusto ho niya yung number 7, lucky number 7. Kaya yung pong uh, paggunita natin na uh, nakaalala natin September 21 ng uh, proklamasyon ng Batas Militar at ginawa niyang Thanksgiving Day yan, Noong panahon niya, yan po ay parang uh, nako, ano, no? in a way, he still controls the narrative. At uh, lalong-lalo na ho sa kasalukuyan dahil uh, bagamat palahating siglo, imagine ninyo, no, that's half, half of 100 years. Palahating siglo po, eh, ang nangyari po ay mukhang hawak pa rin nila ang narratibo o hawak muli nila ang narratibo. Kaya nga ang ating hong mensahe eh, reclaim the narrative. Pero how do we reclaim it? ba? Diba? Uh, we cannot reclaim it by being uh, an elitist. Ibig sabihin ni eh, tatawagin natin lahat ng mga naniniwala sa Pangulong Marcos na sila ay mga bobo. No? Uh, kapag ho, agad ganun ang inyong uh, approach, tayo-tayo eh, na lang ang mag-uusap at uh, yung mga taong nais nating makausap natin at makumbinsin natin ay lalong hindi natin makukumbinsin. Kailangan nating maintindihan bakit ganoon ang kanilang pananaw at uh, primarily kailangan nating isaalang-alang ang frustrations ng marami na hindi naging ganap bagamat naibalik ang demokrasya at human rights ay hindi naging ganap dahil may ilan sa mga makapangyarihan ng patuloy ang kabilang na yung mga tao na tumulong sa diktadura ay patuloy na namayani at ginamit sa kanilang political ends, no? sa kanilang interest, ang ating justice system at ang ating electoral system. At sa, matag- sa maraming panahon, sapagkat uh, marami ng biyaya ang demokrasya na ibigay sa sambayan ng Pilipino, sa ating lahat na pinakikinabangan natin ng mga kalayaan na yan, ang problema po ay patuloy na namayani yung interest ng iilan. So kaya ako may ganyan na sana magbalik na lang yung dati. Kung yung pinalitan naman eh, eh yung, yung pinalit naman natin ay hindi na sistema, ay hindi naman epektibo. So paano natin, kailangan dalhin natin yung narratibo para sa demokrasya at human rights so sa tinatawag natin na kaginhawaan. So nagsisimula tayo sa pag o pagdi-discourse, pagpapaliwanag sa diskurso na mas naiintindihan ng mga mamamayan. So, siguro, magsisimula ako doon sa notion natin na 
notion ng marami, I mean, na kabayanihan yung ginawa ni Pangulong Marcos nung ipoklama niya yung Marshall, oh, sapagkat nililigtas niya tayo mula sa komunismo. Oh, kabayanihan ng proklamasyon at dahil isa lamang ang leader, tinanggal niya yung kongreso, walang nakikialam sa kanya, oh, ay walang, kumbaga, eh, walang uh, nakapigil sa kanya na gawin ang mga magagandang proyekto niya para sa bayan. Yung ba kaya marami daw hong mga kalsada na naipatayo at impastaktura? At undeniable yan. Hindi ko ho dinideny yan at nakatulong ho yan sa marami tao. Ang electrification ng bansa natin, ang mga rural provinces natin, ang mga road networks natin. Oh? So, paraming ginawa. Kaya siya po ang pinakadakilang presidente ng Pilipinas at uh, nagkaroon ng giminto ang panahon. So kabayanihan ng proklamasyon, kaya naman dahil sa dami ng kanyang ginawa, bayani siya. Eh siguro balikan natin, ano pa yung definisyon natin ng bayani sa kulturang Pilipino? Ayon kay Seyo Salazar, ang definisyon ng bayani, ha, mula sa salitang wani, wani kaya kawani, tumutulong sa bayan ng walang inaantay na kapalit. Tumutulong ng walang inaantay na kapalit. So, tignan po natin yung definition na yan. Now, yung pong bayani ay kaugnay ng konsepto ng bagani o yung warrior na nagtatanggol sa interes at kaginhawaan ng bayan. Oh? At sabi ho ng iba, wala akong konsepto ng human rights ang mga Pilipino. Pero kung susuriin po natin, meron tayong konsepto ng kasi sabi na Western concept ng human rights. Kaya kapag ka nakikita mo sa mga interview ng mga ibang opisyal ng pamahalan, galit sila sa human rights. Parang sinasabi nila, masama ang human rights. Kanina lang umaga, may narinig akong opisyal, sinasabi niya, masama ang human rights. Parang pinapasama niyang human rights groups. ba? Diba? So, parang pinaglalaban yung public interest at human rights. Pero ano ba ang konseptong Pilipino ng human rights? Galing po yan sa konsepto ng pakikipagkapwa-tao. Wala akong katumbas sa English yan. When you see yourself in the other. When you see yourself in the other first. Yan ang kapwa mo. At ang bayani at ang bagani ay ginagawa ang kanilang ginagawa para sa bayan dahil sa kanilang pakikipagkapwa-tao. Okay? So, maraming nagawa ang Pangulong Marcos. Opo. In fact, Medyo nakakatuwa na nga na ipinamumukha lagi at kahit naman anong administrasyon, ano, ipinamumukha lagi sa atin yung kanilang mga nagawa. Pinaaalalahanan tayo, sinasabi pa sa atin na Oy, kung, kung ikaw ay kritiko ng Pangulong Marcos at ng kanyang ginawa, eh, huwag po kayong sumakay ng LRT. No? Huwag po kayong magpagamot sa hack center. No? May mga ganun pang mga tirada. Nakikinabang naman daw tayo doon. Subalit, Oo, maraming nagawa, hindi mo natin tinatanggi. Pero, bakit ganoon? Okay lang yan na i-recognize. At i-recognize natin yan. Pero hindi ba obligasyon naman ng bawat lingkod bayan ang may gawin? At yung dami ng nagawa ay hindi ba dahil din sa dami ng taon na inilok-lok sa kapangyarihan? Ay kaya may mga proyekto na naipatupad. Hindi ba pera naman ng taong bayan o kung inutang man sa ibang bansa ay binabayaran at pinananagutan ng taong bayan ang mga proyektong ito, mga kaibigan? So yes, we recognize na may initiative sila. Leadership is really important when it comes to these projects. Pero hindi ba dapat sabihin natin na atin to, wala dapat mag-claim na in na sabihin na huwag kang sasakay dyan kung ikaw ay kritiko. Diba? Sapagkat ito'y pera ng taong bayan at proyekto ng taong bayan. Oh? So yun ang sagot ko dyan. Ito'y tungkulin nila ang mga proyekto nito. Now, ginito ang panahon. Ah, una sa lahat, bago yan, bago natin isa-isahin yan, gusto kong tignan lang saglit, ano, ano ba yung uh, talaga bang ang martial law ay pinatupad para iligtas ang sambayanan mula sa komunismo? Kaya dapat po, Noong 1970 pa, ipinoklama ang Marshall Law. 
Subalit, ang nangyari po, o ayon sa kanyang diary, eh pinag-isipan pa niya. No, no first quarter storm kung saan magulo, kung kailan magulo ang mga protesta. Sabi mo niya, we could allow the situation to develop naturally then after massive terrorism, wanton killings and an attempt at my assassination and a coup d'etat, then declare martial law or suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus and arrest all, including the legal cadre. Right now, I'm inclined towards the latter. So sabi niya, kailangan e eh, magkaroon mo mas maraming Uh, karahasan. Huwag muna ngayon, sabi niya. Huh? If we do not prepare measures to counteraction, they will not only succeed in assassinating me, but in taking over the government. Huh? One of them is to abort the subversive plan now by the sudden arrest of the plotters, but this would not be accepted by the people. So kaya sinabi niya, we could allow the situation to develop. Then ide-declare ang martialo pag dumami na yung karahasan na yun. Bakit? Is it really to save the country? Eh dapat eh ginawa na niya nung January 1970 pa lang nung nagkaroon ng gulo sa Kongreso. Pero bakit palalalain? Bakit hihintayin na lumala at madeklara ang martial law? Daya rin mismo ni Pangulong Marcos ang nagsabi, If I want to be perpetuated in power, this is the easier way to it. Yun po. Ibig sabihin, makikita po natin yan na talagang para po yan sa kanyang mapahaba ang kanyang kap, ano, kapangyarihan. So, yes, may communist threat daw, pero hindi ba numala ang NPA dahil sa martial law? Mas tumami ang naging NPA ng libo-libo? Oh? Yan po ang makikita natin. Oh? And other thing is, sabi nila, gininto ang panahon ang uh, martial law. And, Si JC Punong Bayan, marami yung article about this. Diba? Pero kailangan din nating makita na may, may katotohanan na sabihin na Marcos brought us to the highest levels of our GDP. Kung titignan natin sa illustration na ito, noong unang mga taon ng martial law. Oh? So, kaya naalala nung iba na parang maganda yung ekonomiya. At siyempre, dahil mas mababa yung bilihin nun, dahil tumaas na yung halaga ng fresh ng, ng, ng piso, lalong-lalo na noong mangyari yung oil sack crisis. O kung alam niya lang na sana, eh, alam niya kung kailan siya titigil, eh di sana tumigil na siya dito sa panahon na ito. 1978. Oh? Eh kaso, eh, gusto pa niya talagang mamuno, eh ang nangyari po, eh, nagkaroon ng oil sack crisis and dahil walang nagsasabi sa kanya ng kung ano yung maling ginagawa niya dahil pinakulong na niya, wala siyang mga kritiko, akala nila tamang ginagawa nila, eh, oil, oil, uh, nagkaroon na nga ng krisis sa ekonomiya, ang nangyari pa ay he was still building edifices based on uh, utang. So ang nangyari ay bumagsak ang ating ekonomiya sa level na hindi pa nakikita since World War II at hindi pa nakikita after that. Naging point negative, naging negative point seven point three. Oh, ng 1983 hanggang around 1980, late 1985. So actually, nakarecover lang yung government ay nagsauli ng uh, 685 million US dollars dahil hindi maipaliwanag ang yaman na ito sinuli sa ating pamahalaan. At uh, nagkaroon sila ng marangyang pamumuhay kahit na ang dami hong nagugutom lalo sa Negros, na yung mga cronies nila, hindi lang naman ng mga Marcoses, pati yung mga kumampi sa kanila at mga nakinabang sa kanila, eh nasira yung ating ekonomiya dahil binagsak nila ang ating sugar industry at nagkaroon ng mga batang Negros na payat na payat. At mga namatay, bata pa lamang. At nagkaroon ng malnutrisyon sa Negros na pinakain ng Oxfam na napakaraming bata dahil sa malnutrisyon. Siguro huling bahagi, no? Joel Abong, tama, no? Si Joel Abong ang batang na ito. Huling bahagi, pakikipagkapwa-tao ba? Compassionate society ba? O, ang, uh, ang ano na ito, ang, ang regimen na ito. O, eh, tandaan natin na sistematiko po yung human rights violations na ginawa sa mga biktima. O, 
sistematiko po. Ibig sabihin ng sistematiko, ito ay naging pare-pareho. No? Ibig sabihin, may sistema. Hindi ito dahil na pagtripan lang ng mga ng mga PC o pulisya o ng mga sundalo. No? Ito si Kape Pedyok no, na nakulong din noon, pero human rights, naging human rights lawyer, pinapakita ang biktima na natorture. No? At, yung, uh, at pakikita rin natin na uh, uh, yun, uh, sa Amnesty International, 3,240 daw ang pinatay, 34,000 ang nagdanas ng torture. Pero napakahirap na talagang bilangin kung gano'ng karami. Sapagkat yung iba hindi naman dokumentado. So uh, hindi natin masigurado. Pero alam natin libo-libo ang biktima at sampung libo po yung verified na may mga uh, na, na may mga Uh, claims at nabayaran po ang marami sa kanila bilang hindi dahil sa pera, kundi dahil sa uh, pag, uh, pagbibigay ng uh, recognition doon sa kanilang sa nangyari sa kanila. At alam natin na sistematiko yung naging pag-torture, iba-ibang klase ng pag-torture na hindi dapat uh, ibigay sa kahit na sinong tao, pangunguriente, water cure, no? pagpapainom ng tubig at pagsipa pagkatapos at yan. Uh, at marami pang ibang mga makahayop na mga pagtrato. At marami yung nabiktima ang mga uh, ang mga ganitong klaseng sistematikong paglabag sa karapatang pantao. Now, tandaan natin na hindi natin sinasabi na kapag ka never again, eh, si Pangulong Marcos lamang ang ating uh, kinokondina. Basta't may human rights violations, kokondenahin natin sa kahit anong administrasyon. At sinasabi natin, hindi natapos sa panahon ni Pangulong Marcos ang mga paglabag sa karapatang pantao. Hindi rin natapos sa panahon ni Pangulong Marcos ang plunder. Baka dumami pa nga ang nagplunder. Bakit? Kasi hindi na parusahan ang mga nagplunder sa atin nung una. Kaya may pagkadismaya ang bayan sa ating Uh, sa nangyari sa atin. Kaya parang gustong magbalik sa strongman role. Pero strong leadership ba means autocratic leadership? Sana ho makita ninyo na kung walang checks and balances, walang kongreso, sinarang kongreso, walang, walang, mga, walang pre-press na titingin sa mga katiwalian, may abuso talagang mangyayari. Kaya po, sana po ay maging matapang tayong lahat naharapin ng katotohanan, ang pains, ang mga sakit ng ating kasaysayan, hindi lang sa panahon ng batas militar, kundi sa maraming panahon ng ating kasaysayan. Bakit? Because, because when only when we face our pains in history, kapag hinaharap natin ang mga sakit na idinulot, ay tulad sa love life, pag ikay nasaktan, matututo ka na magkaroon ng mas magandang mga pasya at makatwirang pasya. And so ano bang klaseng pinuno ang ating pagpapasyahan sa mga susunod sa susunod na halalan. Hindi ba? Kailangan umanap tayo ng bayani. Pero bayani ba ang nakinabang, ang nagnakaw sa pera ng bayan? Bayani ba ang walang pakikipagkapwa tao? Ha? Yan po ang ating pag-isipan. Dahil hindi lamang po ito tungkol sa pag-correct ng tax ng kasaysayan. Ito po ay tungkol sa ating kinabukasan at sa pagkatuto natin na hindi na maulit ang mga sakit ng nakaraan. Harapin natin ng sakit para maiwasan natin ang mga sakit ng ating nakaraan. Marami pong salamat at mabuhay ang alaya. All right. Okay, nahihirapan po ako mag-unmute. Anyway, maraming salamat Prof. Shao Chua. Ayan, maganda 'yung nasabi ninyo no na na pag-usapan natin binalangkas ninyo 'yung usapin ng pagtawag ng bayani. Kasi parang ang dali-dali na lang tawagin niyan ngayon eh. Pero maganda 'yung katanungang iniwan ninyo, bayani nga ba ang isang taong nagnakaw sa kaba ng bayan? Pero bago ko kayo pakawalan, Professor Shao, siyempre hindi po kayo makakataka sa tanong na ito. Kasi bilang isang historian, 
ano po ba ang inyong pananaw sa mga personalities? For example, ito recent lang, yung isang uh, sikat na host, si Ms. Tony Gonzaga, no? isang napakahusay na host, pero nagamit niya po yung platform niya para uh, gamit ang card ng neutrality at fairness daw. Okay, so nabigyan na plataforma yung anak ng diktador para balikan, sariwain yung mga greatest learnings niya from his father. As a historian po, anong pananaw niyo dito? Dahil naniniwala ako sa freedom of speech and expression, dahil yan ang balangkas ng tunay na demokrasya, kinikilala ko ang karapatan ni Tony Gonzaga na itanong ang gusto niyang itanong. Pero kailangan, uh, hindi rin ito mapipigilan tayo na maging critical doon sa kanyang ginawa. At tignan ang konteksto. Ano ba yung konteksto nito? Diba? Malapit yung pamilya ng kanyang asawa sa mga Marcos. O kung baga, uh, merong pag, uh, paghanga ang uh, pamilya. So, ang, 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 merong kung baga, may connection. No? At uh, alam nyo, expected naman yung mga tanong ni Tony you know lifestyle no yung mga ganyan so balit siguro yung framing na lessons from my father sa title doon nagkamali talaga sana mas neutral na title lang yun nilagay pero sa totoo lang yung neutral na yan neutralidad hindi talaga totoo yan kasi kahit tayong mga historians ay may kinikilingan na mga paninindigan no? pero kailangan maging parehas tayo no so may kinikilingan tayo si Tony meron ako meron ikaw Jules meron Ikaw, kumikiling ka sa katotohanan, sa so, uh, freedom of the press. Ako, kumikiling sa human rights na, at demokrasya. Pero uh, makikita natin na kailangan eh, uh, fair tayo, fair. Di ba? Parehas. Yes. So sana, mm-hmm. siguro may ibang other side na uh, na ano, no, na ipinakita rin or whatever. No? Uh, pero kailangan, aware ang tao na ito yung biases kasi ito yung konteksto. Pangalawa, Correct. nakita natin, Jules, no, na nakakatuwang isipin na may nag expect pala tayo sa ating mga personalities na mas matinding uh, tawag dito, mas matinding uh, um, accountability. Ibig sabihin, hindi mm-hmm. lang natin sila tinitignan na personalidad na nagpapatawa sa atin. Okay. Parang na paalala sa atin, paalala sa iyo, Jules, kasi influencer ka rin. Mm-hmm. Napaalala sa akin kasi mayroon din akong boses na mayroon pala tayong responsibilidad sa ating audience. Diba? Na ipakita rin yung mga pains ng ating kasaysayan. Diba? Uh, para matuto ang mga tao. So, hindi lang dahil tayo ay nagpapatawa, kundi dahil tayong lahat ay mayroong kaisipan. Diba? May, si Tony Gonzaga, napakatalino ng tao. So, nag expect yung tao mm-hmm. na, hindi ka lang, you, you are more than that. You are more than mm, that. Yes. So, I think yun yung... So, diba? Right. So may social responsibility basically, lalo na yung mga personalities na may malalaking platforms. Maraming salamat Prof. Shao. May mga katanungan pa ako sa'yo pero later on, makakapanayam pa rin namin kayo at syempre maaari natin ma-accommodate din yung iba't ibang mga katanungan ng mga ating mga kaibigan dito sa Zoom at sa Facebook. So kung may questions kayo para kay Prof. Shao, mag-comment na kayo dito sa chat box o sa Facebook. Maraming salamat po Prof. Shao. See you later po. Mabuhay. Mabuhay po kayo. Okay, ngayon naman po mga kaibigan, ang susunod po nating guest speaker ay isang award-winning book author. Sinulat niya po ang librong To Suffer Thy Comrades, How the Revolution Decimated Its Own. Isa pong aktivista noong dekada 80 at kasama sa mga lumaban sa diktadurya ni Pangulong Marcos. He's also one of the conveners of the Peace Advocates for Truth, Justice, and Healing. Upang ipaliwanag sa atin, kung bakit nga ba tayo patuloy na nasa anino ng ating nakaraan at kung ano ang kinalaman ng transitional justice. Ano nga ba itong transitional justice? At maka- uh, pag-uusapan natin ang usapin na ito, makakasama natin ang transitional justice advocate. Let's welcome Mr. Robert Francis Garcia. Sir Robert, go ahead, Bob. Magandang hapon sa lahat. Salamat, Jules. At salamat din, Xiao. Uh, uh, bago bago ko simula na gusto ko lang sabihin sa lahat na i-deliver ko yung talk ko sa lingwaheng Ingles. No? Uh, ang dahil niyan, dahil baka may mga tao sa ibang bansa na gustong makinig sa mga ginagawa natin dito sa Pilipinas o gustong tumulong sa atin. Kaya uh, yun ang napili kong lingwahe. Gayunpaman may mga halong Tagalog din ito. Kaya in short, Aglish yung gagawin natin. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this festival. TFDP, JPICC, AMRSP, PARA, 
Dakila through its active Vista Center for involving me in this exercise of looking back into our recent history. Babalik tanaw. And some people do not want us doing this. They would say, why keep harping on the past? Can we not just move on? Bakit nga ba kailangan pa natin laging nagbabalik tanaw sa nakaraan? Huh? One, one reason is obvious and an oft-repeated saying that was beautifully put by philosopher George Santayana. No? Sabi niya, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. The danger of falling back to the sins of the past, we actually see this already happening now. Nangyayari na talaga ito, bumabalik. As the title of this program aptly puts it, we are living in the shadow of the past. Another reason is that there are forces that are vigorously pursuing a well-funded campaign to manipulate and distort the reading of history. They are the forces who put up the dictatorship themselves in the first place in favor of those who benefited from this very dictatorship as elaborated eloquently by Xiao earlier. Yeah, yung mga nag, nagtayo nung matumulong sa pagtayo ng dictatorship, sila rin ang may interes na na i-sanitize ito, ika nga. Before going to my main topic, let me just say a bit more about this historical whitewashing. Just uh, this weekend, my daughter's friend was in our house to join a small private dinner. It happens to be my daughter's birthday yesterday, September 20. And meanwhile, my son's birthday is tomorrow, September 22. Don't ask me how, but apparently the date September 21 was avoided by the family. But I digress. My daughter's friend was telling us about her classmate, an avid and rabid Marcos supporter, declaring that Marcos was in fact the best president our country ever had. I wasn't really surprised. That sentiment is somehow all over social media, especially recently, remember. It's a well-funded historical revision campaign. Most of us heard the same from Marcos's son, Bongbong himself, just recently, na pag-uusapan nga kanina in that infamous Tony Gonzaga interview. Sabi ni Bongbong, I am the son of the longest-lasting president who brought the Philippines into the modern world. Talagang iniyabang niya, no? And I do not know how anyone can be proud that his father kept himself in power the longest. At least he wasn't proud of the fact that they were eventually forced out of the palace. We, we often hear or read preposterous uh, arguments to back up the best president claim. Kesyo, katulad ng mga nabanggit na kanina, maraming naita yung infrastructure, mas disiplinado mga Pinoy noon, mura ang bilihin, and so forth. And on Marcos's human rights violations, they say tuloy-tuloy pa rin naman ang patayan after Marcos. In fact, hanggang ngayon. Actually, I won't dispute that. No? The killings did continue and has gotten really bad under the present administration. In fact, let me say at the outset that the problems we have now are the result of our inability to undo the many aspects of Marcos' governance. And these continue to haunt us to this day. Kumbaga sa bahay, hindi natin natanggal lahat ng anay. No? And the termites that we were not able to remove uh, were able to populate anew. And now, slowly, insidiously, we are seeing a renewed infestation. Our current society and state of governance have practically become, in many ways, a Marcosian reinfestation arang pagbabalik ng anino o multo ni Marcos in the, perso- in the persona of Duterte. But uh, I'm getting ahead of my story. I was asked to talk about transitional justice. Baka alien ang termino na ito sa iba. No? And I'm still grappling with how to discuss it without being too academic. So I'll just try to be more descriptive and use a little PowerPoint. So, I'm going to share screen lang ako saglit. And let's hope uh, this works. And let's hope that technology cooperates with us. Ah. So, nakikita ba yung ano? Uh, kita naman, ano?
Okay. Let's begin with the definition. No? Konting academics, pero hindi naman, ta- hindi naman magtatagal dito. Don't worry. According to the UN, the United Nations, transitional justice is the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with a society's attempt to come to terms with the legacy of large-scale past abuses in order to ensure accountability, serve justice, and achieve reconciliation. Take note of the highlighted phrase, large-scale past abuses. Maramihan at malawakan. Meantime, the International Center for Transitional Justice, or ICTJ, where our next speaker, Ruben, works, also defines it similar, similarly. The, uh, the uh, Transitional justice is the way countries emerging from periods of conflict and repression address large-scale or systematic human rights violations so numerous and so serious that the normal justice system will not be able to provide an adequate response. So large-scale atrocities, post-repression, post-conflict, shoot bang Pilipinas dito. Before addressing that question, let me just quickly add the so-called pillars of transitional justice. O sa TJ na lang for short, ang nickname natin para mas simple. Ano ba mga tinataguyod ng TJ? Uh, there were originally four pillars, which later uh, became five. No? Ang una dyan, right to truth. Siyempre, pag may massive violations, gusto mong katotohanan. No? Truth. Right to justice. Right to reparation. Guarantee of non-recurrence. Yan yung unang apat. And then later on, just recently, idinagdag yung right to memorialization. There is not enough time to to elaborate on these pillars, but we just need to emphasize that they are interrelated. On the matter of truth, reality needs to be known and established. That's the first step in finding justice. Justice is what? What is justice? It is fixing things, righting a wrong, which can be punitive, may kaparusahan, restorative, or can take the form of reparation. Pagbabayad ng danyos sa salita natin. And then, guarantee of non-recurrence. It is fixing structures and systems so that the wrong will not happen again. And part of that is memorialization so that society will not forget. Newer generations will continue to learn the lessons of the past and not wake up to such statements as Marcos is our best president, etc. Ad nauseam. Now, let's go back to the question. How does transitional justice apply in the Philippines? Let us look a little further back. Medyo layuan pa natin yung pag-look back natin ano, to provide more context. Just like many countries in the world, our country has a colonial history. Alam natin lahat yan, napag-aralaan natin sa eskwelahan. We often joke that we, we were under 300 years of Catholic Church colonization under Spain and 100 years of Hollywood. There was also the Japanese adventurism during the Second World War. And now, as a side note, Chinese expansionism in the South China Sea. Our country is so beautiful that we have had so many aggressive suitors. Pinag-aagawan tayo ng mga manliligaw galing sa labas or more than suitors. We've had seducers, stalkers, harassers mga mangaangkin ng yaman at puri ng inambayan. These colonial incursions have fundamentally altered our society and were ultimately responsible for our current economic landscape. And kung ano yung kung an, kung ano yung ekonomiya natin ngayon, kung ha, itong architecture niya largely as a result of that colonial legacy. With its huge uh, wealth disparity, mass poverty, lack of industrial development and oligarchic control over politics and economy. The colonialists left with us a mixed bag, actually. While they may have brought some kind of modernity in the Western mode, they have also left behind an unfortunate legacy, the politics of rent-seeking and patronage, where economic and political interests coincide, a perfect recipe for corruption. 
Yan ang sistema ang masasabi natin dinatnan ni Marcos. In short, to be fair, Marcos, uh, Marcos did not invent this uh, screwed up political economic setup. But he thrived in it and brought it to new heights. His governance was rent-seeking, patronage politics on steroids. And he had to maintain this by brute force through complete control of all branches of government, especially the military. As we know, we have suffered a brutal, brutal authoritarian rule under martial law for 14 years, during which there was economic stagnation, widespread repression, and corruption, so mind-boggling that Marcos was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as having committed the biggest theft of government treasury. So, meron na tayong Guinness record maliban dun sa mga sapatos ni Imelda. And that theft, government theft, is estimated to be between 5 to 10 billion dollars. Hindi ko ma-imagine yung ganong kalaking amount. Marcos embodied the perfect storm of misrule. A dictator cum human rights violator cum kleptocrat. And uh, compounding all these were the armed conflicts. The communist insurgency nationwide and the Muslim self-determination struggle in the South. And we still do. Hanggang ngayon naman, nandiyan pa rin yung ano na yan, ano? Yung insurgencies na yan. These were among the um, and these were among Marcus's main justifications for martial law. Again, as mentioned earlier, the threat posed by the communist and Muslim rebels. And ironically, the effect was the complete opposite. Lalo lang silang lumakas. This gives us with probably a self-evident lesson in governance. Very basic: you step up repression, you fuel rebellion. So that's the back, backdrop in a nutshell, you know, Philippine State and History 101. Now, in all this, what can be considered the Philippines' moment of transition? Samba tayo nag-transition, ano, to which the principle of transitional justice can apply. This would be February 1986, when Marcos was eventually forced to uh, relinquish the power he was holding on for 20 years and we had the chance to rebuild real democracy to reboot the system Ika nga, no? if, we, if we can use computer speak to transform society in the transition to democracy kaya yan, nagkaroon tayo ng pagkakataon noong 1986 na ayusin yung mga winasak sa panahon ng diktadura ni Marcos and uh, masasabi naman natin na to a certain degree, we were successful. There were institutional reforms, katulad ng bagong constitution. We had a new constitution with ro robust human rights provisions, asserted civilian supremacy over the military, check and balance, freed media from government control. And then we uh, there were cases filed in a U.S. court against uh, against Marcos's criminal acts with 10,000 claimants. Marcos was convicted, actually, and the courts ordered the payment of damages to, to victims amounting to $2 billion. And then, Trinidad uh, nating i-recover ang mga ninakaw ni Marcos through the Presidential Commission on Good Government. And uh, may mga na-recover ding amount 170 billion estimate. No? And then, meron tayong reparations. A reparation program through the Public Act 10368, which created the Human Rights Victims Claims Board and the Human Rights Violations Victims Memorial Commission. <clears throat> through this law, reparation and recognition were provided to more than 11,000 victims of martial law. And then, Ang isa pang ginawa natin ay peace negotiations with rebel groups, which is still, uh, masasabi natin, work in pro progress. Kaya ilan ang mga uh, photos ng transitional justice initiatives in the past. This is uh, reparation. Memorialization. Itong building na ito, wala pa, pero it's in the, in the works. Ano? 
uh, Martial Law Human Rights Museum to be constructed at UP. Commemoration of a massacre that happened during martial law in Palimbang in Sultan Darat. Uh, so mga commemoration. So these are just examples of transitional justice. But uh, masasabi nating hindi enough yung ginawa nating transitional justice. There have been huge gaps. Ano yung mga gaps na yun? Una, lack of punitive action. No perpetrator has been jailed. No? Maaring binayaran natin yung mga na biktima, pero yung mga responsible for those crimes have not been punished. Lack of frustration. Violators were still able to run in elections and win. Pangatlo, the bulk of Marcos's stolen wealth have not been recovered. And as we see, nagagamit pa rin ngayon to deodorize their image. Armed conflicts unresolved. Tuloy-tuloy pa rin ang gyera. Martial law lessons are lost. They weren't included in the education curriculum. And this partly explains why many Filipinos, including youth, still believe that Marcos' time were the golden years. And then inequality and poverty remain. In short, the post-Marcos Philippines was not exactly a brand new model, but simply a reset to factory settings. We just returned the country to the kind of elite-based democracy we had prior to martial law, but it was not transformative enough. And we have yet to achieve that genuine, progressive, empowering society of our dreams. We're not the man shooting for the moon. We're just... Um, we're just for reasonable standards, katulad ng full protection of human rights and civil liberties, participative and deliberative democracy that is beyond elections lang, no? strong institutions with checks and balances, economic progress and equitable distribution of resources, social services and welfare, human security, opportunities for human development. So lahat ng mga ng iniisip natin, okay na na maisama sa lipo ng nagbago. Of course, we are not there yet. And based on these yardsticks, we remain deficient. Kapag tinimbang ang lipo na natin, talagang kulang pa. Pero pasulong, pasulong na sana tayo dyan sa, ano na yan eh, sa mga ingredients na yan that make for a good society. We were already building these aspects of democracy throughout the decades after Marcos but it was uh, probably much too slow. Economic progress, reforms in our politics, professionalizing security forces, electing better leaders, uh, mga pipe dreams pa rin. But, uh, and uh, somehow, uh, the waiting for these gave way to impatience and discontent. Dahil marami na rin namang nagsasuffer sa paghihintay na mas magandang kinabukasan, which allowed the strong man devil may care persona of, of Duterte to manifest, promising change. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, someone came, bumubuga ng apoy. But as we see now, it was a turn for the worse. Kaya, masasabi natin yung democratic project natin at this point, time, epic fail in, in millennial parlance because Apparently, we're back to square one. Uh, I won't go through this in detail dahil baka kinakapos na ako sa oras. Ano? Pero I'll probably go to the last part of my uh, my presentation na parang like back to square one tayo yeah. under Duterte who was elevated to power on the strength of... Uh, right-wing populism that seems to be a glo growing global trend. Um, Duterte has brought back authoritarian rule that is practically a carbon copy of Marcos's playbook. He doesn't even hide his admiration for the dictator. Kaya, kita natin pagpapalibing sa libingan ng mga bayani, etc. Then, the armed, clon the the armed conflicts remain unresolved. The peace process with the Muslim rebels has reached significant progress, and this could only 
this could probably be the bright spot and we can only hope that they do not blow it. The communist insurgency rages on and now we seem to be and now they seem to be the ones being used to justify the targeting of unarmed activists. So on the whole, this is now our state of affairs. What needs to be done? Most urgently, we need to arrest authoritarian slight huh? and reclaim the path to democratization. Then let's consider transitional justice. Issues old and new that involve large-scale atrocities and therefore are relevant to uh, are relevant transitional justice concerns are piling up. Let me summarize them here. Una na nga itong Marcos Martial Law. But there are issues that are also TJ, no? tulad ng the Bangsamoro uh, peace process. And uh, masasabi nating transition, transitional justice is integral to the peace negotiations with the Bangsamoro. The communist armed conflict, kailangan din ng transitional justice dyan because obviously it uh, continues to rage and claim victims from both state and non-state perpetrators. And then we had the Marawi crisis where the complex issues of violent extremism and excessive state response resulted to the wastage of a city and a massive casual, civilian casualty count. And then the war on drugs that is churning out tens of thousands of victims of extrajudicial killings, nearly all of them belonging to the poorest of the poor. At kung hindi yan large-scale atrocity, I don't know what is. And the COVID-19 pandemic response, which has led to large-scale suffering in the form of deprived health services as well as massive corruption. So these are just some of the challenges we face. Marami pa sigurong issue na ma ma sasabi nating uh, in the mold or in the in the province of transitional justice. So this is just a, a short list. And uh, personally, these are the PJ issues that occupy, occupy my mind and my time. I currently work with the Commission on Human Rights as a consultant, and we have created the loose formation of PJ experts and practitioners, which we call PJ League or a Transitional Justice League. Uh, pinili namin yung pangalang Transitional Justice League kahit na mas marami sa aming fans ng, ng Marvel. I'm also involved with the TJ project based in Ateneo that focuses on documenting women's narratives that have direct uh, TJ implications. Through the, these initiatives, we continue to lay down building blocks so that when we reach an environment that is more friendly and conducive to transitional justice, then we are ready. So, pa pasensya na kayo kung medyo lumagpas ako sa oras, uh, pero that's still in a nutshell, marami pang pwedeng pag-usapan about transitional justice. But we hope to be able to push the discourse forward. Thank you very much and good afternoon. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Bobby Garcia. Maraming maraming salamat po sa pagpapaliwanag lalo na dito sa terminong transitional justice na most likely marami sa atin ay first time na encounter to o mas na-expound. So thank you so much uh, Sir Bobby Garcia for expounding this uh, matter. This is a very important step towards understanding our past at marami pa tayong kailangan malaman patungkol dito. Thank you so much Sir. Makakasama namin kay Uli Mamaya para sa Q&A. Now to give us an international thank you sir to give us an international perspective on transitional justice and how other nations work for it our third speaker is a senior expert from the International Center for Transitional Justice and has worked with other governments and non-government institutions in designing and implementing transitional justice mechanisms he's also a former commissioner of the Presidential Commission on Good Government his work has been instrumental in retracting the ill-gotten wealth of the Marcos family and was in charge of the litigation, investigation, and successful recovery of $680 million of the ill-gotten asset hidden by the Marcos family in Switzerland, the U.S., and other foreign countries. To lead this discussion, let's call in Attorney Ruben Carranza. Attorney Ruben, go ahead. Hi, good. Um, magandang... Ano ba ngayon dyan? Uh, hapon? Hapon. Lahat, hapon umaga sir. dito. So, um, 
katulad ni Bobby, I have to speak in English um, also mostly because um, Cebuano ako so nahihirapan din ako magtagalog. Um, sig- eh, hindi ko alam kung masishare ko yung slides ko. Uh, but uh, let me look for it now. And um, Does it show? Yes, po. So, siguro I'll skip uh, some of what Bobby said. Uh, he read the definition that we use in ICTJ where I work um, on transitional justice. And it's not the best definition because it doesn't tell you much about how effective it is or how useful it is. Uh, but I'll go straight to the questions that you wanted me to to respond to, and I'll try my best to respond to them. How does the Philippine experience with martial law and transitional justice compare with that of other countries? What actions that have been taken elsewhere can the Philippines consider? How did other countries memorialize their past, including their past involving dictatorships? And then, ang importante tanong na mahirap sagutin, after 2022, What forms of accountability can be pursued? And I will quote your question for human rights violations and the pandemic response of the uh, Duterte government. Um, I'll I'll tell you a story that might be helpful. Um, and I'm some of you might be old enough to know who these people are in the picture. But uh, in my work, I I meet a lot of activists and human rights lawyers, and I I have been working in Tunisia, uh, a country that where the Arab Spring began uh, a few years ago. And when I went there the first time, um, I landed at the airport. I took a taxi and I had to share a taxi with someone from Chile. Uh, his name was uh, Pepe Zalaquet, Jose Zalaquet. And, and Pepe Zalaquet was a member of the Truth Commission of Chile. And so when I introduced myself, he asked me if I knew attorney Senator Jose W. Jocdol, I said, of course I did, but of course I also met Senator Jocdol a long time ago when I was still a student. And Pepe said that he was a friend of Senator Jocno and then proceeded to tell me a story about how the dictator in Chile, uh, Augusto Pinochet, that's the one on the left of Imelda Marcos in that picture, uh, once was able to wangle an invitation, his first invitation as a dictator for a state visit. Uh, several countries had been approached by Chile. They refused to invite him. But there was one country that actually invited Augusto Pinochet to, to pay a state visit to, and that was the Philippines under Ferdinand Marcos. Uh, once it became known in the Philippines that Ferdinand Marcos, who had already declared martial law at that point, uh, had invited Augusto Pinochet, there were protests outside, uh, rare protests, but outside the Chilean embassy and uh, in public. Uh, this alarmed the foreign minister of Chile, uh, but they, he did not inform Augusto Pinochet. Uh, but it probably disturbed Marcos enough that Marcos decided to cancel the invitation for Augusto Pinochet. The problem was Augusto Pinochet was already on the plane en route to the Philippines, to Manila, and had to land in Fiji Uh, because he was told by his foreign minister that Marcos had cancelled uh, his invitation. So even dictators like Marcos knew that dictators like Pinochet were not welcome in, in their own country. So this uh, event uh, in the picture was the, the burial of another dictator, uh, Francisco Franco, the dictator of Spain, uh, to which Imelda Marcos and Augusto Pinochet and his wife uh, were invited. Uh, what's important about this picture is that it took decades, of course, from the time of this funeral uh, and after uh, Francisco Franco was buried in Spain to exhume his body. But decades after his funeral, his body was finally exhumed last year. So it's possible. It's possible to rectify the way dictators are honored. It's possible to cancel invitations for dictators. It's possible to shame them. And that's what other countries have done. I'm not going to go over the 
transitional justice processes that Bobby has mentioned, except for one that I will mention later called vetting. So aside from truth commissions, criminal prosecution, reparations, memorialization, and reforms, there's something called vetting that I might be able to say something about. Uh, one question that has been important in other countries is how far back do you go back to deal with the past? And so I have done work in Kenya. And in Kenya, uh, they have in fact gone as far back as just before independence from the colonial government of the United Kingdom. Um, their process included reparations for a an insurgent army that fought the colonial government of the United Kingdom. Uh, the UK was forced to pay reparations, was forced to fund a memorial. And this was the memorial that was established in Nairobi that uh, ICTJ and in my own work um, helped build and, and help get funding for. So it can go far back. It can go as far back as colonialization. And in the Philippines, that's not new. Uh, the Bangasamoro Transitional Justice and Reconciliation Commission, in fact, covered even a period even prior to colonization from Spain. So there's precedent and then there, there's that Philippine example that is uh, important. Uh, memorials are another example of transitional justice and this is a memorial in Argentina for the more than 30,000 people who were disappeared during the military junta. So it's a wall with their names. And in the Philippines, you have this in the Redemptorist Church in Baclara. An example, again, countries share examples of memorialization. Countries share examples of how transitional justice can, can be pursued. And you can see this happen across the global south. Uh, aside from symbolic reparations, you have material reparations. And again, this is an example from the Philippines. And I'll say a little bit about this later, uh, wearing my former PCGG commissioner hat. 200 million was used to fund reparations for over 10,000 victims of the Marcos dictatorship um, through the reparations law in the Philippines. Now, I helped, well, I actually drafted the very first draft of this reparations law when I was PCGG commissioner. But as some of you know, it took over a decade and not until the administration of uh, President Benigno Aquino uh, that the law was finally passed and then implemented. Uh, another form of reparations that is material but more than individual is community reparations. And in Peru, uh, in the aftermath of conflict with Maoist um, rebel groups, uh, they included community reparations uh, that provided electricity, additional schools, healthcare for communities most affected by the conflict in Peru. Now, this is important to consider in the Philippines uh, because I was just told last yesterday that there is now a bill pending in the Philippine Congress uh, to provide reparations for communities affected by the conflict in Marawi. So that's one example to consider. Um, are apology considered reparations? They are, but they are not always a form of justice. And this is an example of an apology uh, this is from Cambodia before the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Uh, this is uh, Duke, one of the torturers of the Khmer Rouge, who apologized in the course of a trial. What was important? What is important here to consider is that the apology is in the context of being punished. In other words, it's not an apology that will then reinforce impunity, but it's an apology that is part of a process that led to punishment. On the other hand, this is an example, again, from the same region where the Philippines is. Uh, this is Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, in the past, before the latest coup by the military, she had already advocated for forgiveness for the military. And that's a problem that highlights the question of forgiveness, that forgiveness alone and apologies alone cannot constitute justice. Now, uh, truth commissions have been established and are always known as one example of transitional justice. They are temporary body. They, they're off, uh, and their purpose is not so much to lead to prosecution as truth-seeking in its own right. And one of the most prominent truth commissions is, of course, the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, chaired by Bishop Desmond Tutu, the, the man with the crucifix uh, in the picture. 
to Bishop Tutu's right is Alex Moraine. Uh, he was vice chairman of the South Africa Truth Commission, and Alex was in fact the first president of ICTJ where where I work. Now it's important to note that after the South Africa Truth Commission finished its work and published its report, there were expectations of reparation. Some form of reparation, payments of compensation was made, but many other human rights violations were excluded, including economic crimes and corruption in South Africa under apartheid, which prompted some civil society groups in South Africa to set up their own transitional justice mechanism, specifically to address economic crimes committed during and after apartheid. Uh, officially, they were able to push the South African government to then create what is called a state capture commission to examine large-scale corruption post-apartheid in South Africa. And this commission is still going on. Uh, I'll add this because I'll say something about this at the end. Um, in South Africa, one of the issues that was never addressed in the Truth Commission and even now in the economic crimes process is that the World Bank and the IMF actually supported apartheid and sustained it in South Africa. They were never held to account. They were never found as enablers of apartheid. Uh, in Argentina, and Argentina is often used as another example of transitional justice. We know there was a truth commission. We know, as you saw earlier, that there have been memorials for the disappeared. What is not known is that Argentina has tried to incorporate corruption committed by the military junta as part of transitional justice. Uh, it wasn't always supported by donors, by Western government. And it was not until decades later that Argentina established an economic crime student in its own Ministry of Justice to uh, address the enablers of corruption during the military dictatorship. Businessmen, uh, banks, and others with economic, committing economic crimes have been investigated. Um, so there have been many examples in the global south of countries that combine both examining human rights violations and corruption as part of the transitional justice process. It's important to note that because in the Philippines, while there was a presidential commission on human rights established right after the Marcos dictatorship, it was dissolved after its commissioners, including its chairman, um, Senator Jokno, as well as uh, its commissioner, my commissioner and the PCGG Heidi Yorok resigned after, in the aftermath of the Mindiola massacre. So what was left in the Philippines was the PCGG, while the PCHR was dissolved. In the meantime, in other countries, in Chad, the Truth Commission covered both corruption and human rights violation. In South Korea, you had corruption investigation as well as trials for corruption of former dictators in South Korea. So you can see the trajectory in other countries versus the trajectory in the Philippines. This is the example in Chad. Uh, Isini Habri, who just died a few months ago, uh, was finally convicted a few years early after this Truth Commission report was published. Uh, in the Philippines, like I said, you had the PCGG continuing even as the Commission, the Presidential Commission of Human Rights had closed. And that's where uh, I think uh, Chao earlier uh, mentioned the recovery of 680 million in Marcos' uh, ill-gotten wealth from Switzerland. I was involved because I was uh, in charge of litigating those cases uh, in the Philippine Supreme Court and in the Sandigan Bayan, and then investigating the same uh, case uh, in Switzerland. Um, part of what I did was to draft the reparations bill, as I said earlier, so that not only would the Philippines recover this asset, but we make sure that the recovery would also benefit victims of the Marcos dictatorship, which is why 200 million out of the 680 million was used to implement reparations for the victims of the dictatorship. And another $10 million was set aside for the Memorialization Commission. I inserted that into the draft bill so that there's enough funding uh, for transitional justice or at least reparations, and that funding would not be the subject of debate uh, in the Philippine Congress. Now, um, maybe I should already note here that while this bill was being discussed and I was still commissioner in the PCGG and immediately after, there were already objections, not just from the Marcos family. Um, I mean, Marcos would often um, summon me uh, to her office to talk to me about this bill. And in response, I said, 
I, I was still PCGJ commissioner. Ang, ang sagot ko sa kanya was, meron din akong opisina. So siya ang pumunta sa opisina ko. So we never got to meet. Um, one of those who tried to block uh, the reparations bill was uh, uh, Senator Chief Escudero, for example. Not block directly, but you could see that he was trying to maneuver it so that the bill would uh, be diluted. So there were several others who tried to do this. And of course, Juan Ponce in really uh, voted against the reparations bill when he was a senator. Um, there are other examples of truth commissions that dealt with corruption. Kenya is another example. Uh, but let's go directly now to Tunisia, uh, where the Arab Spring happened. Uh, this is where the student who set himself on fire, the fruit vendor, I mean, who set himself on fire, uh, it, it was in this town and I took this picture and they have established a memorial uh, to honor Mohamed Bazizi, uh, who in, in, essentially sparked the Arab Spring. And in Tunisia, they had established a Truth and Dignity Commission that covered both human rights violations and corruption, as well as the phenomenon of marginalization of poor regions in the country. And this is an important development in transitional justice because now you have a more coherent and a more direct approach, not just to corruption, not just to human rights violations, but to economic and social rights violations uh, during a dictatorship. And in Tunisia, this is important again, uh, the World Bank knew that it was supporting and enabling the dictatorship, uh, including its corruption, including its human rights violations. Uh, another form of transitional justice is, of course, trials and punishment in courts, but it's important to consider vetting of public officials. And vetting has happened in several countries, whether it's the vetting of police, the vetting of military, or even the vetting of uh, public servants, uh, those with cases of corruption, those who have been charged with human rights violations, uh, have been vetted and have been removed from office. Um, there are, of course, questions about due process, questions of law around the process of identifying and removing, but it's important to consider that in the Philippines, there were attempts at vetting, but they were then challenged. And the only vetting that effectively succeeded in the Philippines was the removal of uh, justices of the Supreme Court, most of whom resigned right after the dictatorship. We can go back to that, but this is one area in which the Philippines obviously has suffered. Uh, you have the Marcoses returning to public office, you have Marcos Cronin returning to public office, and you have several other officials linked to human rights violations, including torturers who become senators and now running for president in, your, in the Philippines. Um, prosecution is, of course, a a, can be domestic and can be international. And of course you have there my classmate who when he was still a congressman had already, was already spokesperson of Rodrigo Duterte even then. Um, it can be international. And as we can now see at the ICC, uh, you have crimes against humanity cases that can be pursued involving uh, not just armed conflict by uh, armed conflict crimes against humanity, but even drug war crimes against humanity. And that's an important contribution by the Philippines because in the past, in Mexico, for example, uh, that option of investigating drug war violence in Mexico was rejected by the former prosecutor, not uh, Fatou Ben Suda, but Luis Moreno Ocampo. Um, just a couple more slides and then I'll, I'll, I'll end. Uh, one of your questions was, what do we do after 2022? Uh, how can we hold this current government accountable for its pandemic response? And there's an old, old truth-seeking commission established in New Zealand uh, that investigated in 1919 the impact of the Spanish flu and, how, and why there were so many deaths, at least relatively speaking, in New Zealand because of the Spanish flu. So there's precedent for truth-seeking involving a pandemic, involving a healthcare issue, involving potentially violations of the social right to health. And it's possible to address violations of economic and social rights to healthcare, to the pandemic response, to corruption uh, happening during the pandemic and memorialize their victims. And this is an example from Peru where they uh, put up photos of those who have died 
Peru has one of the largest uh, fatalities in Latin America from the pandemic. So what can be done? And this is just you know, bullet points. These are not all that I can suggest. These are things that I came up with uh, in the course of thinking about your question. Um, the, the Philippine reparations law can be extended to cover victims of the war on drugs, for example. Uh, as I said earlier, there's now a discussion in the Philippine Congress on reparations for uh, the Marawi conflict. But, um, and, and interestingly, Aimee Marcos and uh, what's his name, the former police chief who is now a senator, are supposedly sponsors of this bill, but they refuse to include deaths and killings uh, in Marawi as part of this bill on reparations for Marawi. A second suggestion would be to disqualify from office those identified by the PCDG as having benefited from ill-gotten wealth. I, in fact, wrote uh, a few years ago uh, for the 2016 election, I wrote to a Comalek commissioner who's a friend of mine uh, to see whether this was possible, uh, given that the PCGG law, uh, executive order number one, actually identifies the Marcos family as uh, having committed corruption. In other words, there's a legislative finding. So this is potentially something that creative lawyers in the Philippines can do. How do we implement this law and disqualify from holding office, from running for public office, the Marcos themselves? Um, it's important to review the education curriculum to incorporate not just, you know, the stories of the Marcos dictatorship, but data on dictatorship history. Um, when I was PCGG commissioner in Locos Norte, had organized its own Marcos Day, uh, organized by the Department of Education in Locos. So what I did was to write to the then Secretary of Education questioning why a holiday was being celebrated in Ilocos Norte to honor Ferdinand Marcos. The education secretary wrote to the uh, education regional director in Ilocos Norte and told them not to hold it. Uh, at that time, the education secretary was Raul Rocco. So it's possible. It depends on who your education secretary is. A uh, uh, fourth point is to prosecute drug war crimes using the Philippines Crimes Against Humanity Law passed in 2009 before the Philippines even signed on to the uh, ICC treaty. There's also a separate for future law, the same law that we use to recover assets of the Marcos from Switzerland. Uh, finally, it's important to think again about setting up a truth commission, but this time that includes economic enablers of the dictatorship, and not just of the dictatorship, but perhaps even of the current administration. So cronies, uh, should be investigated through a truth-seeking process, not just through prosecution, not just through asset recovery. The World Bank that lent money to the Marcos, to the Marcos dictatorship, should be investigated. Uh, corporations and foreign governments that enabled the dictatorship, including through uh, supplying of weapons or to recognizing their fraudulent elections, should be subject to truth-seeking. So many other steps can be taken, and I think um, those can be taken uh, using political will. So let me end there, and I think Bobby and I can answer questions. All right. Thank you Salamat. so much, uh, sir. Thank you so much, Attorney Karanja. Mas lalo nating napalalim ang ating pagintindi kung ano itong transitional justice and how transitional justice initiatives had worked for other countries. Kung meron po kayo mga katanungan on transitional justice for both Mr. Robert Francis Garcia or Attorney Caranza, maaari niyo po itong isulat sa ating chat box. Or kung, kung kayo po ay kasama natin sa Facebook Live, pwede niyo rin po itong ilagay sa ating comment section or sa ating Jamboard. Yung link po dito ay nishare din po natin sa chat box. Ito po ulit ang link ng ating Jamboard. Diyan po nakikita niyo kung saan niyo pwedeng isulat ang inyong mga tanong or kung meron kayong mga comments sa ating topic. Nakikita ko rin naman na very active ang ating mga viewers dito sa uh, Zoom. So maraming salamat po sa inyo. Um, yeah, uh, babalikan natin sila Attorney Caranza at si uh, Sir Bobby later on for the Q&A. But we move forward. Another very important topic that we have to unpack this af afternoon is how we as Filipino people tell our story as a nation. In Filipino sto storytelling, we have what we call bida and kontrabida. Yan. Is isip kayo, sino ba yung mga bida at mga kontrabida usually? In our folklore, sometimes the contrabida is not an ordinary human being. Sometimes they are monsters. Some bother to hide in their fangs, but others don't. 
to help us unveil these hidden monsters, we would like to introduce another esteemed speaker. She is a Filipino feminist and award-winning author, a journalist and human rights activist. She was one of the journalists who became a political prisoner during the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos. She now resides in the U.S. and is a co-founder of Affirm, a transnational feminist organization. Let's all welcome our next speaker, Ms. Ninocha Rosca. Ma'am, go ahead, Bob. Hi. Kumusta po? Magandang umaga. Uh, very impressive ang mga presentations so far. But, so, magpapasubali ako. Hindi ako academic. Hindi ako professor. Ako po ay uh, hamak na manunulat at isang organisador at tiba. Good morning from my time zone. Thank you for the time and space to help me unravel some thoughts which have been swirling in my mind for decades. It has been 50 years. I have spent my entire adult life under the shadow of this Hinayupak na martial law. This dismal phenomenon na pinawalan ng wax statue. Add to that, that at this time, we have to deal with his progeny, si Senadora Aimi at si PBM na gustong maging presidente now and forever. Uh, apologies if I cannot be fully intellectual about our topic. We just held a tribute for Sixto Carlos with participants uh, from uh, three continents, most of them already white-haired like me, still trying under what, whatever circumstances they find themselves trying to help the country. Uh, isang malalim na buntong hininga po. 50 years should have been enough for us to deconstruct the body of martial law and to advance from opposing that concept towards opposing the social, political, and economic context which has enabled the fear of martial law to survive. Uh, I have a slide uh, presentation here. Let me see if I can share it. Ito ako masyado magaling dito. But... Ito po ang title ng ating presentation, Ousting One Man is Not Enough. Okay, so what is martial law? This is a very ordinary general definition from Wiki. Uh, as we can see, it's the temporary imposition of military control of normal civil functions or suspension of civil law by a government usually in response to a temporary emergency, and so on and so forth. Uh, we never quite saw um, military control, total military controls, pagamit uh, ng martial law on uh, various presidents. Um, but now the power to bring about this temporary imposition is expressed in our constitution. We have had constitutions in the last 86 years 
Now, itong pagpalit-palit ng constitution is actually contributory to the to our inability to stabilize and institutionalize our democratic processes and institutions. So, what are these provisions? Uh, 1935 Constitution, this is it. Always uh, lawless violence, invasion, insurrection, or rebellion. Ito yung ginamit sa akin ni Marcos uh, ng ako'y hulihin na yung warrant of arrest mentioned this, uh, inciting to rebellion, insurrection, uh, inciting to subversion, insurrection, and or rebellion. Medyo napa, napabilib ako sa sarili ko. <laughs> okay, this was 1935. Uh, this is the 1973 constitution. As we can see, medyo lumapad na ang kanyang uh, definition of what martial law should be. Medyo malaki-laki na siya ng konti. But nandun pa rin yung invasion, insurrection, uh, rebellion, tapos merong lawless violence, blah, 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 blah. Now we have the third constitution, which is uh, the 1983. Uh, a 1986 constitution, as we can see. Makapal na siya, no? Mahaba na siya. Uh, at mas elaborate na. Meron ng mga cannot be uh, exceeding 60 days. Mga, meron na siyang mga caveats, you know? Meron na siyang mga restrictions in the 1987 uh, constitution. Some of this, ito, mahabang mahaba na ang uh, specifications on what martial law should be when it can be declared and the limitations to that phenomenon. Uh, we construct more and more barriers to the exercise of this legal power of the president. Looking at this definition, though, we find it is rather, uh, all of them are rather simple provisions to take away the civil, political, and human rights of a constituency by those who rule them. So the next question to ask is very simply, this. First, do civil, political, and human rights exist for enough of the population to support the concept of a common good? And second, is a formal declaration of martial law necessary to eradicate civil, political, and human rights? Those two concepts. Bilang is an organizer, you have to think in these larger terms, not only in terms of laws, jurisprudence, juris and constitutional provisions, but in terms of what is the context in which martial law or the provisions for martial law operate. The first one, do we have really a consolidated concept of what is a common good? What is the common good for Filipinos? In other words, what are our national interests? That is the first question. And second, the second question, is it necessary to declare martial law to lose your civil, political, and human rights, to make you lose civil, political, and human rights? Uh, Now, this is, we are in the middle of a very strange phenomenon. Uh, um, a very strange phenomenon uh, called the formally scandal. Okay. 
Bakit siya nagganyan? Okay. In the middle of this pandemic, the family scandal is still happening. And, but it has shown us very clearly how both citizens, non-citizens, and foreign corporations can indeed play fast and loose with both the process and the rules of governance. The critique of the family scandal has been in terms of corruption and uh, corruption and cronyism. I would like to view it as a violation of human rights, the right to health, which is part of the UN Declaration, Convention on Human Rights, one of the 34 provisions. Um, it may seem far-fetched to us now, but it took us women almost 10 years to push the ICC to recognize systematic rape as a war crime. So we could uh, push for a case on, of uh, a crime against humanity revolving around the deprivation of health measures uh, by the deprivation by the Digong administration of health measures for our people in the middle of this pandemic. I am sure there would be lawyers who would be willing to try this. Um, in one of our discussions, uh, I asked attorney Robert Swift, uh, who was a lawyer for the first tort case against uh, the Marcos estate why he did what he did and his answer was very simply i wanted to create jurisprudence and by the way more money has been recovered from the marcos estate than what the pcgg uh, managed to get to millions and millions of dollars uh, via the tort case of uh, led by attorney Swift. Now, I have this screen up and I'd like you to look at this and understand what it is. Where, where we ask, where then did this impunity uh, towards chronic capitalism, towards murder, towards the erasure of civil and human rights? Where did all this come from? Uh, this disenfranchisement of such a huge sector of our population. Five years of tolerating the creation of an abattoir of murdered human beings tell us that the fault lies not in the legal instrumentalities uh, provided by the Constitution, but elsewhere. The late great Senator Jose W. Diopno used to scold me every time we met in New York City. He did not like that I was not paying attention to the creation of a culture that would not only allow our people to survive, but to thrive. He got so impatient with me I think that one evening, as we were dining at a Korean restaurant, I think around a dozen of us, he started reciting Tagalog poetry to me. And of course, with that voice, he subdued the entire restaurant to silence. Well, I think what he was saying was that there were far more important aspects to our national life than just legalese, you know. Uh, and one of the most important aspects is the social and civil context, the social and political context of what we were going to. We must look at the culture and consciousness and value systems which enable the very idea of martial law to remain a bogey 
in our minds in all its various forms, from the allegedly anti-terror law to the Pogo stealth invasion, to the cavalier tolerance for the COVID virus, which has kept, which kept the archipelago's borders open even as Wuhan was being locked down, and even to the willingness of so many to become croaking francs of a creeping dictatorship, a non-formal dictatorship, but a dictatorship nevertheless. In other words, aside from dealing with this politically and economics and in economics, we must deal with this as embedded in our social organizations and social practice. And I'm speaking here from the family to religion to even our friendship systems. Authoritarianism is very simply the enforcement or advocacy of strict obedience to authority at the expense of personal freedom. We have various uh, experiences of this from the small to the large one. I grew up in a very authoritarian family, for instance. Um, and then of course, authoritarianism uh, expresses itself in three forms. You have dictatorship, totalitarianism, and fascism. Now, the amazing thing is that authoritarianism has the corollary quality of making individuals compete for the favors of the authoritarian. Even though we see this as a kind of uh, single um, mono, what would you call this? Uh, a single uh, structure, very rigid. It is actually Darwinian in its view of human relations. Uh, we are very familiar with the words, with the phrase matira and matibai but this is how authoritarianism uh, works. It works against the collective. It works as a, uh, as a compulsion to maintain authority via decimating those in the rising ranks. There should be no, co no competition to the one who is the authority. We should look at the rate of decimation of Duterte supporters, for instance, uh, right now, medyo nagkakagulo yung uh, PDP laban ni Kusi at Pimentel, a very good illustration of how uh, ginagawang gladiators yung mga followers niya, maglaban-laban kayo at I will remain in charge of everything. Now, the other irony, the second irony of authoritarianism is that meron ng competition among the subsets of the hierarchy, but it also cultivates the idea of a savior, the strong man, that one cannot be self-reliant, but must expect help and salvation from a powerful, a more powerful authority. The airlifting of the Marcos family in 1986 was an instant of intense demoralization for the nation, as it strengthened the idea that those with power were immune to justice uh, inflicted by those who have been rendered unjust. Um, that's why I'm a little bit, uh, medyo hindi ako masaya, although masaya rin sa ICC decision to investigate um, the Duterte 
administration on the issue of the drug war. I've always believed that the first and primary justice should come from our people. And we have been deprived of that opportunity time and time and time again from uh, trying and rendering justice on those who collaborated and so on and so forth. Um, now, this is the other thing, okay. Uh, authoritarianism is of course decidedly macho. Yeah, as it relies on brute power and strength uh, rather than on knowledge and wisdom. And even its female and marginalized gender adherents exhibit a kind of brute power mitigated by a sexualized uh, subservience to prime authority. We therefore found such ludicrous aberrations as the Malakas and Maganda iconography of Ferdinand Marcos. I have included here as a kind of uh, ironic annotation, an ironic annotation, the statement of Ferdinand Marcos on February 24, 1986. I remember laughing when I read this. I am just like an old war horse smelling powder and getting stronger than ever. He was dying for God's sake. He was, he could barely walk and so on. But look at this. There is a lesson in this uh, trope uh, from the Marcos era. We find this very similar um, use of uh, strength and sexualized power um, under the Duterte regime. I think one of its um, I hesitate to use the word celebrated, but known influences, uh, constructed influences. I use the word constructed because the woman would probably not even influence her husband if she had any, were it not for uh, the existence of Duterte as president. Anyway, she said something like, President Duterte is a sex god. Uh, and we have seen pictures of Duterte um, with various women kissing them, holding them uh, on his lap and so on and so forth and so on. So this sexualized iconography fits in handily with his bevy of what we would call beta males as opposed to the alpha male who is, of course, Digo. Then you have the beta males, but they're kind of like uh, either caricatures, cartoons, or feminized. So you have the range from Harry Roque and down to uh, De La Rosa. Uh, who is a comic character, I think, and down to, uh, it's a kind of descending ladder of Julalai Hood, huh? descending ladder. Ironically, the quintessential feminine icon, well, feminized icon of macho hood is is, uh, shall we say, uh, Christopher uh, Bon Go, Senator and Eternal Julalai of the President. What could be more feminized than this, than this forever love declaration for the President? Why may tomawa nakita ko? Somebody. Uh, post commented, ha, 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 ha. Okay, now, we must look at this as really examples of a very dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, trend, not only in the Philippines, but globally. 
Christopher Baum, who is an evolutionary anthropologist, believes that, that human society is tending more and more towards hierarchy and authoritarianism. This tendency nullifies the first cultural revolution in human history, the first cultural revolution. The establishment of egalitarian hunter and gatherer societies triggered by the female homo sapiens realization that for the species to survive, first, male violence had to be curbed and B, competition will have to be minimized in favor of cooperation. I think uh, most anthropologists will tell you that the survival of this species relies so much on cooperation, on collective endeavor. Anyway, this cultural leap was what took human social organizations uh, from the usual primate groupings. Uh, as we look at the chimpanzee or the gorillas, we see that the or the, their organization, their herd organization, is in terms of uh, an alpha male in charge of the group. Okay. We, and he has all the privileges, including food, sex, etc. Now, the status of alpha male has to be won through violence. There are combats, you know, and challenge to the alpha male, replace re, his replacement by a beta male who has defeated him. Anyway. Uh, it was against this social kind of primate social formation that the female of our species revolted. And how they carried it out is a very complex story about sex, menstruation, and cosmetics. But that story is for another time and another discussion. Now, intrinsic to the cultivation of a secondary and tertiary ranks of what I call Julalai Hood is the cultivation of ignorance of what we in the literary world calls a willful suspension of disbelief. In this case, a willful suspension of political disbelief would be more apt. Our current chaos of disinformation, fake news, fake charges, trolls, and the accoutrements of propaganda have their roots in the dictators and the dictator's need to create belief in himself, you know, because a dictator is invariably a narcissist. So let us hide back to the origins of our fake news and disinformation. Ah, 27 World War II medals of heroism. Um, si Anunga, si Chao Chuba wanted to make us define what is a Bayani. In this case, you know, in the fantasy of the dictatorship, it's 27 medals. Where they came from, nobody knows. Now, the overthrow of a dictator does not destroy a dictatorship, nor the propensity to turn to the idea in times of acute crisis or stress. One must eradicate the infrastructure of dictatorship. Political infrastructure, yes, but also economic, social, and cultural. Uh, what do we mean 
by the infrastructure of dictatorship. Chronic capitalism is one of the most pernicious aspects and one of the most dangerous components of this infrastructure. Note please, at this time, who, who have been funding the resurgence of this idea of a dictatorship. The same names who benefited during the Marcos dictatorship, economically, uh, they benefited economically, continue to this day and pour uh, resources into the resurgence of the tyrant, whether it is Duterte or another Marcos. These are not plain businessmen. These are ideologized businessmen who long for lost privileges, despite their having so much privilege already. Part of destroying the infrastructure is holding everyone accountable. I'm sorry, this is such a violent slide. Uh, there are many ways of holding um, individuals accountable. You can dispossess them, you can disenfranchise them, you can refuse to allow them back into the country. You refuse to allow them to have a normal social existence. Uh, you don't rub elbows with them, you shun them. And you keep on repeating and repeating and repeating the litany of their crimes against the nation. And never, ever, ever think that it is respectful to be wealthy when that wealth has been through chronic capitalism. I will note here that none of those who went through imprisonment and torture, not to mention uh, who had had relatives murdered, received justice. We got compensated, but that is not justice. The demoralization of the nation, the instilling of a bartered, battered nation syndrome, uh, BNS, these are all traceable to the dictatorship. Not only tolerance, but rewarded these people, these members of the infrastructure of the dictatorship. And some of them we have even rewarded with political power for one act of bravery in a lifetime of subservience. As we have seen, most of them have gravitated back to supporting tyranny. Uh, JP is a prime example. I have heard it said, and I should stop. Oh, how do I stop sharing screen? Oh, okay, thank you. I have heard it said that even poverty is bearable if there, there is fairness and there is justice. I posit this, that even the most extreme demands for discipline in our organizations would be bearable if there were democratic processes and democratic agreements. I will then leave you with this injunction. The struggle against martial law is a small part of the struggle against authoritarianism. We must guard against the latter, not only with regards to the state. We always formulate our idea of democracy, human rights, civil rights, etc in terms of our relationship to the state. We should think in terms of our relationship to one another when we think of the struggle against authoritarianism. We need to evolve the 
a different kind, perhaps, of human relations if we are to confront the crisis of our times. Thank you. Salamat po. All right. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo. Thank you so much, Ms. Ninotska, for connecting our history to a deeper sense of our story. We'll have you again later on for a quick Q&A. But right now, to talk to us about how we can move toward a real and genuine democracy, kasama natin ngayong hapon na ito ang Executive Director ng Diokno Law Center. He's also uh, currently the Chairman of the Free Legal Assistance Group or FLAG, the oldest and largest human rights organization in the Philippines. Friends, ang atin pong woke lolo. Please welcome Attorney Chel Diokno. Attorney Chel, go ahead. Okay, unmute po natin si Attorney Chel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for unmuting me. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat at uh, alam nyo kakaiba itong araw na ito. Uh, especially for someone like me dahil yung mga memories ko ng martial law ay bumabalik at uh, talagang sobrang sabihin na lang natin may mga bagay na hindi hindi ko makakalimutan hanggang sa huling araw ko dito sa mundo. I remember on September 22, 1972 when my father was first arrested. Alalang alala, alala ko yung araw na yon at uh, actually gabi gabi yon dahil uh, may kumatok na mga sundalo sa aming tahanan iniinbitahan nila yan ang sabi nila sa aking ama na sumama sa kanila sa military camp sabi naman ng aking ama ito ba isang uh, paanyaya na pwede kong tanggihan at ang sagot ng colonel ay sorry po pero kailangan sumama kayo sa amin hindi ko makakalimutan yung oras na yon dahil yun ang huli namin pagkikita na siya ay isang uh, malayang Pilipino. Susunod na dalawang taon, siya ay nakakulong na wala naman kaso, walang warrant of arrest, wala man lang dahilan kung bakit siya inilagay sa piitan. Yun yung aking awakening bilang isang Pilipino. Napaisip ako noon eh. Sabi ko kung kaya nilang gawin yan sa isang senador ng ating republika, isang uh, kilalang abogado, eh, paano pa kaya ang ordinaryong mamamayan? Ako po ay isang anak ng martial law. Labing isang taong gulang ako nung dineklara ni Marcos ang martial law at uh, 25 taong gulang nung naisipa natin sila sa Malacanang. Palagi ko hindi niya magugustuhan yung sitwasyon na uh, yung buhay noon ng uh, buong kabataan ko. Kasi nung panahon ng batas militar ay bawal lahat. Bawal ang pagtitipon-tipon. Bawal ang uh, pagmamatcha, bawal pati student council, bawal mag-strike, bawal magbatiko sa ating pamahalaan at uh, kontrolado ng mga Marcos ang lahat ng balita. Kung minsan ay sila pa nga ang uh, nagmamanufacture ng balita at sila pa yung nagkakalat kasi nakakalat dahil hawak nila yung lahat ng media outlets noon. Yung mga tulad ng ABS-CBN ay tinake over ng mga Marcos, yung iba pinadlock, yung iba naman na uh, mga kaalyado nila ay hinayaan na mag-operate pa rin. Ngayon, nung unang, nung unang mga taon ng martial law, 1972, 1973, 1974, mga ganon, ay talagang walang kumagalaw, walang lumalaban sa batas militar sa na openly meron tala, meron mga nag underground meron mga talagang gustong um, labanan itong uh, diktadorya ni Marcos pero takot pa lahat ng ng mga tao na mag uh, uh, lumabas sa kalsada o kahit papano magpaabot ng kanilang saloobin sa administrasyon ni Marcos naalala ko yun kasi ako mismo Frustrated na frustrated ako. Yung feeling ko ba ay parang ano bang nangyayari at uh, bakit takot lahat ng tao. Pero ang dahilan kasi ay hawak talaga ni Marcos lahat. Hawak niya ang buong uh, 
executive department, pati siyempre mga sundalo at pulis. Siya na rin ang uh, naging kongreso dahil pinadlak niya ang kongres at tinangkin niya yung uh, pangkapangyarihan na maglabas ng mga batas. At uh, pati ang ating um, hukuman, yung ating judiciary ay kontrolado niya. Uh, binigyan din niya yung sarili niya ng kapangyarihan mag-issue ng executive warrant of arrest. At maliban doon, ay talagang hawak niya sa leeg ang lahat ng mga judge at justice. Ito ang isang bagay ng batas militar na hindi gaanong napapag-usapan na ano ang naging epekto ng martial law sa ating justice system. Palagi ko dapat pag-usapan natin ito eh. Kasi hanggang ngayon, ramdam na ramdam natin yung epekto nito. One week after he declared martial law, Marcos issued a letter of instruction, LOI number 11. Nirequire niya lahat ng mga judge, justice, at pati mga government officials na mag-submit sa kanya ng letter of resignation. Na hinahawakan lang niya. Pero pag hindi kanya nagustuhan, ay tatanggapin niya yung letter of resignation ng kung sino man yun. At uh, next day, wala ka na sa public service. Hindi pa siya nakontento noon, mga January ng 1973 ay pinalitan niya yung ating saligang batas. Doon sa 1973 Constitution, nilagyan niya ng isang provision. Ang nakalagay sa transitory provisions ay lahat ng mga justice at judge natin ay pwedeng matuloy, maupo sa pwesto hanggang sila ay magre-retire. Pwera na lang kung magdi-decree si Marcos na tanggal sila sa trabaho. In other words, hawak ni Marcos sa leeg ang lahat ng judge at lahat ng justice sa buong Pilipinas. Kung meron man maglalabas ng isang desisyon na hindi niya magugustuhan, madali niyang tanggalin. Isang pirma lang at wala na yung justice o wala na yung judge na yun sa ating uh, judiciary. Anong naging epekto niyan sa batas natin? Anong naging epekto niyan sa ab mga abogado natin? E isipin niyo kung kayo ay abogado noong panahon na yun at gusto niyong kumuha ng malalaking kliyente, yung mga malalaking korporasyon. Nakita nila yung mga judge ay halos captured na ng, ni, mga, ni Marcos. O di sabi nila, eh kailangan ako rin ay didikit sa palasyo. Kung hindi ako didikit dyan, hindi ko makukuha yung aking mga uh, client, yung mga malalaki, hindi ako kikita. And that was where corruption within the legal profession was born as an organized activity. Kasi ang nangyari nun, may mga abogado, nakita nila yung opportunity, nagtayo sila ng mga network. Dikit sila sa Malacanang, meron sila mga kilala sa mga business, sa police, sa mga jail officials, and so on. Pero ito nangyari. Kahit na natapos na ang martial law, kahit na nabuwag na natin yung diktaduryang yan, ay hindi natin nabuwag yung mga network na yon. Kaya hanggang ngayon, ay nag-operate pa yung ilan mga network na yan. At uh, ang legal profession ay halos nahati dun sa mga nagpa-practice ng law na maayos, diretso, at dun sa mga nagpa-practice ng law na nag-aayos ng kaso. So that is one of the legacies of the dictatorship that we still have today. And that is the biggest obstacle to our development. Ang pinakamalaking hadlang sa pag-asenso natin ay yan pagkukulang natin sa hostesya dito sa ating bayan. Isipin nyo, paano, natin ba ma, paano tayo magkakaroon ng pananagutan kung ganito pa rin ang justice system natin? Paano tayo natin masusugpo itong mga issue ng organized crime at ibang mga smuggling, drug syndicate, etc.? Kung ganitong kahina pa rin ang ating justice system, that is one of the lasting, well, legacy is the wrong word, but lasting effects of the dictatorship. Ganun pa man, um, yung panahon na yun ay doon din sa, sa sobrang kadiliman ng panahon ng martial law, ay doon din nanganak naman ang human rights. At... Uh, ang kwento ng human rights ay actually kwento ng aking ama at kwento ng ibang mga abogado na kahit papano ay nakahanap ng tapang sa kalooban nila na tumayo at manindigan laban dyan sa batas militar. Kahit na nung panahon na yun ay halos takot lahat ng tao. 
actually ang what drove them what drove them was something deep inside them something that i believe is in all our dna something that i believe we have had in our country ever since we were occupied by the spanish forces and we still have that fire in each of us today kasi kung titingnan natin mula pa ng panahon ng mga kastila hanggang ngayon ay ipinaglalaban natin yung ating dignidad at yung ating kalayaan at alam nyo kung sino yung talagang naging nanguna diyan sa pakikipaglaban na yan ay walang iba kundi ang kabataan si Rahay Sulaiman isa sa unang unang lumaban sa mga Kastila 17 years old lang siya nung naghimagsik siya si Jose Rizal mismo ay 23 years old lang nung sinulat niya ang Limitang Kere ito marami hindi nakakaalam One year after the Katipunan was formed, nakaroon sila ng women's chapter. Alam niyo ba kung sino naging members, officers ng women's chapter? Ang kanilang pangulo noon ay si Jose Farisal, kapatid ni Jose Rizal, 28 years old siya noon. Ang vice president nila ay si Gregoria de Jesus, 18 years old. Ang kanilang fiscal ay si Ang- Angelica Lopez, 16 years old. Ang kanilang secretary si Marina Dison, 18 years old. At yung isa sa pinakabata na na-initiate sa Katipunan ay si Delfina Erbosa Irizal. Yung pamangkin ni Jose Rizal. She was only 14 years old when she was initiated into the Katipunan. Siya rin yung isa na nanahinang first Philippine flag. At uh, itong balikan natin yung issue ng martial law. Sino ba ang mga lumaban talaga at nanindigan Sino ba ang mga nagsakripisyo ng kanilang mismong buhay at dugo para sa ating demokrasya, kalayaan at karapatan? Ay, walang iba kundi ang mga kabataan Pilipino din. We almost lost a whole generation of the best and the brightest youth of our country to that terrible dictatorship. Paano natin na, na patanggal sa palasyo ang mga Marcos? Well, unang-una, We had to find the courage and the strength, the fortitude to fight an iron man. Kasi talaga naman, nung, noon ay hawak niya lahat. Lahat ng uh, kasundaluhan, lahat ng kapulisan ay talagang boss nila si Marcos. Isipin niyo yun, na doon time na yon libo-libo ang nakulong, libo-libo din ang na-torture. At marami rin ang nawala hanggang ngayon, hindi pa rin mahanap yung kanilang mga bangkay. At uh, yung mga pangaabuso, yung paglabag ng kanilang karapatang pantaw, hindi lang mga individual ang nagiging biktima noon. Mismong mga komunidad natin, mga kapatid natin na indigenous peoples, mga urban poor, at uh, iba't ibang mga sektor, pati yung mga magsasaka natin, mga hinisda, ay naging biktima nitong martial law ni Marcos. How did we fight back? Well, sabi nila, fear is contagious. Pero ay, palagay ko ay courage is also contagious. Kasi nung nagsimula yung paninindigan natin, iilan lang tao yan eh. Isa, dalawa, tatlo, naging lima, naging sampu, naging singkwenta, naging isang daan, naging isang libo, maya maya ay hindi na mapilang kung ilan ang talagang tumayo at uh, nanindigan para sa ating kalayaan at uh, karapatan. Kaya sana wag nating kakalimutan na yung mga karapatan na na-enjoy natin ngayon, yung karapatan natin mag-post, mag-tweet, magsalita ng malaya, nako, produkto yan ng sakripisyo, ng dugo, ng pawis, ng buhay mismo ng mga Pilipinong lumaban sa diktadurya. Pero ngayon, meron din tayong panibagong challenge. Kasi, Nakikita natin na yung nangyayari noon ay bumabalik. Yung pag-aatake sa ating mga demokratikong institusyon, yung pag-aatake sa mismong kalayaan natin na karapatan natin magsalita ng malaya. Kung maalala ninyo, pati na hindi lang ang ABS-CBN na natanggalan ng franchise, hindi lang ang Rappler at si Maria Reza ang nakakasuhan, pati ordinaryong netizen ay nakakasuhan na rin sa ilalim nitong administrasyon. May dalawa kaming kliyente sa flag. Yung isa ay writer sa Cebu. Ang ginawa lang niya ay nag-post siya sa Facebook 
Mayat maya, nandiyan ang mga pulis sa kanyang bahay at uh, kinatok siya. Hinuli na walang warrant, sinampahan ng inciting to sedition. May kliyente naman kaming guro dito sa Luzon. Nag-tweet, maya maya, nandun ang NBI sa kanyang pinto. Hinuli rin siya na walang warrant, sinampahan ng inciting to sedition. Mabuti na lang, nung umabot yung kanilang mga kaso sa korte natin, meron pa rin mga matatapang na judge na binasura nila yung kaso. Pero paano ba? Ano bang dapat natin gawin para hindi na mangyari ulit ang batas militar? At hindi lang yung mismong martial law na formal declaration, kundi yung pagkikipil sa ating demokrasya, sa ating mga kalayaan. Well, they say that rights are not granted. Rights are fought for. At uh, kung talagang minamahal natin ang inang bayan, kung talagang minamahal natin ang mga kalayaan natin at mga karapatan natin, okay, di dapat manindigan tayo. Dapat talagang ipaglaban natin ang ating, yung pinaghirapan ng ating mga ninuno. Hindi madali, pero palagi ko hindi rin mahirap kasi nasa kalaoban na natin yan eh. It's already wired in our hearts and in our souls. Nasa DNA na natin lahat yung pagmamahal sa ating sa ating uh, buhay bilang Pilipino, yung pagmamahal natin sa kalayaan at sa demokrasya. And you can rest assured that uh, I will be there with you in this fight until the very last drop of my blood. Magandang hapon po at uh, maraming salamat sa aktivista. Alright. Maraming maraming salamat po, Attorney Chel Diocnos, sa pagbabahagi ng inyong uh, kwento. Siyempre, base po yan sa mga facts na inyong naranasan sa ilalim ng martial law. Sa pagkakataon pong ito, inananyahan po ang lahat na buksan ng inyong mga kameras para sa ating photo opportunity. Kasama si Attorney Chel. Sige po. Asensya na po. Ta, kailangan ko malis at meron akong isa pang uh, pupuntahan. Opo. So, after our picture taking, papaalam na po ako. Yes, attorney. Okay, so buksan na po natin. Okay po, uh, Secretariat, go ahead po. Hold lang po ng smile ng mga five seconds. Ay, hey, wait. Marami pa ng page. Sorry. More. Uh, page 6. Um, Last two pages. Thank you. All right. Bigyan natin ng virtual round of applause. Attorney Chel Diokno, maraming maraming Thank salamat you. po. Thank you. Mahalam at maraming salamat. Thank you so much. Ingat po kayo. All right. Ngayon po, tuloy tayo sa ating programa. Babalikan natin yung panel natin kanina para sa very quick Q&A. Uh, namili po tayo ng mga questions sa inyong ibinigay sa, uh, dito sa Zoom, sa Facebook at sa ating uh, Jamboard. Unahin na natin ang ating first question ay mula kay Mark Axi Umaya. Medyo tinweek natin to Mark ha, para mas maging uh, generic question siya. Tatanungin natin to kay Kina Professor Shao at kay Mr. Robert Francis Garcia, kay Sir Bobby. The question is, hindi ba kasalanan ng anak ang kasalanan ng ama? Okay. Sir Shao, ano pong pananaw niyo dito? Well, uh, tandaan natin na uh, hindi naman bata o hindi naman na uh, kumbaga na ipanganak naman na sila noon at in fact eh, may mga oposisyon sa pamahalaan. 'Di ba? Si Bongbong Marcos ay naging gobernador ng Ilocos Norte at that time si Amy Marcos ay nasa kabataang makabayan at uh, kabataang barangay, no? Uh, kabataang barangay, yes. Kabataang makabayan, ano? <laughs> Kamatang ba kang guys? So, ang nangyari dyan eh, parang ano yan, ano, uh, uh, nandun na sila 
in fact may kaso po kay Mamay Mi Marcos ano yung pagpatay kay Ar- Mo. recording in progress. Yung ganong pamumuno. So, ang, ang sinasabi ko dito ay uh, kaya sila may kinalaman ay eh, sapagkat uh, hindi nila eh, walang ano, kumbaga walang pag-ako doon sa nangyari doon sa mm-hmm. noon. At ibig sabihin noon eh, kung sakaling sila ay mahalal, di ba, eh, of course, mayroong secret wish yung iba na oh, natuto na sila sa katano, sa nangyari sa tatay nila. Ayaw lang nilang magsalita. Parang gagawin na lang nila. So, Eh, tignan natin. Pero again, eh, kung, kung hindi nila yun i-acknowledge, parang, at, parang uh, eh, inaano nila yun. Sinosuportahan nila yung ganun. And again, we do not want. Okay. Thanks, Sir Sao. Uh, kay Sir Bobby naman po, anong pong pananaw niyo sa tanong na ito? Salamat, Jules. Na ipapasa nga ba sa henerasyon yan? Salamat dun sa nagtanong. Uh, hindi naman naiiba yung sagot ko dun sa... isinagot na ni Shaw, ano? Kaya uh, sumasang-ayon ako dun sa sinabi niya. At uh, maaaring sabihin nating uh, ang pangunahing accountable, syempre, yung gumawa ng kasalanan. No? Hindi naman natin ibibintang yung buong kasalanan dun sa uh, the rest of the clan. No? 